Welcome to everyone and thanks for being here. I thought um, I would start 50 years ago um, with my odyssey on the subject of civil resistance and do it very briefly. Uh, I was a graduate student at the Fletcher School of Tufts and like many people my age at that time, we were products of the Vietnam War. And I was very interested as a student of strategic studies, war peace studies, about asymmetric warfare. The question was why people with inferior military capabilities would beat people with superior military capabilities. And so the great books of that time, for example, uh, included studies um, about the economic, social, psychological elements of conflict, which I was quite interested in. Um, one of them, uh, uh, one of the great writers about this subject was a man named Tom Schelling, who in 2009 won the Nobel Prize for Economics. I took a course with Tom called Strategy, Coalition, and Conflict, and I told him about my interest in asymmetric warfare. And his, his uh, comment back to me, which was life-changing, he said, well, Pete, if... Um, you're interested in knowing why people with inferior military capabilities can beat those with superior. How about looking at why people with no military capabilities whatsoever can beat people with military capabilities? And he introduced me to Gene Sharp. And um, uh, Gene had just at that time wrote the book, The Politics of Nonviolent Action. Um, and in that book, many, many great things happened, but I'd like to highlight two. The first was that he basically took work by a man named Etienne de la Boite, his work called The Discourse on Voluntary Serv Servitude, published in 1576, and he wrote the following, resolved no more and you're at once freed. You could put that slide up if you don't mind, somebody can. Resolved to serve no more and you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer, then you will behold him like a great colossus. That's not the slide, by the way, if you can move back. If you can move back, there, look at the top. But simply that you support him no longer, then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, full of his own weight and break in pieces. So here's Gene Sharp's contemporary version of this insight. When people refuse to cooperate, refuse cooperation, withhold your help and persist in their disobedience and defiance, they are denying their opponents basic human assistance and cooperation, which any government or hierarchical system requires. If people do this in sufficient numbers for long enough, that government or hierarchical system will no longer have power. This is the basic political assumption of nonviolent action. I could um, uh, tell you that this basic concept that has motivated Gene's work, I have never found in 50 years a reason to argue with. Now, the second thing Gene did in his volume, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, is he, in the second volume, came up with 198 different tactics, nonviolent tactics that are employable against an opponent. Now, just to um, talk to you about an exciting development, my friend Michael Beer, who's hosted this, has basically took Gene's 198 tactics and expanded it by another 150 to reflect the tactical opportunities that exist in highly complex digitized societies. Um, As I said, in the nearly half century I knew him, I have never found a reason to disagree with his scholarship. And this is why I was so lucky that he was, can we move the slide back because the slide is the wrong slide? Thank you, okay. Um, but he was kind enough uh, to basically re be one of my dissertation readers. I wanted to take Gene's work in a slightly different direction. What he basically said was, look, if you disobey long, long enough and persistently enough, the tyrant will fall. It was my feeling that there's a little bit more to look at. And that was that there is a cost of disobeying through repression. And then there's a cost of being disobeyed through the loss of legitimacy. And I was very interested in the distribution of those costs and how 
a, a, a campaign of nonviolent action distributed those costs away from themselves and towards the tyrant. And what it led me to in my dissertation to conclude that how these costs are distributed in a competitive competition for power largely determine the outcome of the conflict. Another way of saying this is that skills of the two protagonists, the relative skill levels determine the outcome much more than the conditions prior to the conflict. And so when you look at conditions prior to a conflict, they might include how nasty the uh, authoritarian is, the level of economic activity, um, uh, the level of ethnic division. All of them have been studied. Maria certainly has done an extraordinary study about this, but they've been studied by Freedom House and others. And they've shown that there's very little correlation between those prior conditions and outcomes. Now, my first experience, I, you know, Gene and I um, in 1983 created the Albert Einstein Institution, but my first experience with Gene in working with dissidents was in Lithuania. You can flip to the next um, slide, please. Um, if you remember, in, the Soviets invaded Lithuania in 1991 and occupied in Vilnius the TV station, caused a lot of death and injury, and we were called by uh, the um, president, Landsbergis, to come and talk about how can we create a different form of defense? And this is a picture of, uh, of Audrius Bukavicius on the right, who was the Minister of Defense, Gene Sharp, and then me 30 years ago uh, in Vilnius. I thought you might like to see that briefly. Um, 20 years ago, I founded the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. And its purpose um, had three dimensions to it, which I wanted to share with you now. The first was to foster research, academic research and studies on civil resistance in all its aspects to basically mature the field. Now, this past year, we had a record number of, uh, of publications. And uh, one of them, again, was Michael Beer's great study about expanding the list of nonviolent tactics. But undoubtedly, one of the most important studies ever done was done by Maria, who's going to speak, and Erica Chenoweth, called Why Civil Resistance Works, which won the American Political Science Association's Woodrow Wilson Award for the best book, Domestic or Foreign. And they basically, for the first time, take many, 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 many cases and, and basically uh, prove a lot of things about the efficacy of nonviolent conflict versus violent insurrection. And it's had a, um, I'd say a profound effect on the field. The second thing that we have done at ICNC is to engage with the policy proximate community, media, think tanks, policymakers, to talk about the impact of assisting campaigns of nonviolent resistance. And I'm, you know, I'm pleased to let you know that uh, we have just ICNC and the Atlantic Council have just formed a joint venture to basically called Fostering the Fourth Democratic Wave to talk about how outside assistance can change the, uh, uh, the, the, the anti-trend, if you will, to the Third Democratic Wave and foster more democratic transitions in the future. And then the last dimension of what we've done has been to work with dissidents around the world. And if you look at the book, we have a chart that shows that we have educated in a five-day wor five workshop form format dissidents from 117 countries. Now, that workshops have been very, very powerful. They've created a real network of which you've been participants in. But what they've done is they've basically been a process of experts transmitting information to dissidents. And <clears throat> it's been my feeling that there's a real opportunity to take this to a new dimension, which I want to talk about now with respect to the book. Um, one of the things that I discovered 
and we all discovered in working with dissidents is that the biggest asset the tyrant has is not his military advantage, but the fear and confusion a population has about what to do next in their conflict. And um, what I thought about was how do we address that fear and confusion? And it led to the creation of the checklist to end tyranny. Now, a little bit of background there. Um, the checklist to end tyranny was based on an idea by a man named Atul Gawande, who wrote uh, the book called The Checklist Manifesto. Gawande was a doctor who headed the emergency room at the Harvard Hospital. And what would happen is people would come in, they'd be shot, injured, their injuries would be complex, they'd be time sensitive, and they'd be life and death. And what he noted was that all his staff would, when they would admit people, would do it in a completely ad hoc way. So he decided to go offline with them and to say, hey, we're going to pick no less than five, but no more than nine things that we're, everyone is going to do the same to basically bring people into the emergency room and, and, uh, and work in a consistent manner. And when they did that, they, their, their results in terms of saving lives and whatever metrics were important just rose dramatically. And he wrote this book to start studying what happens with whether to start studying, discovering that checklists were used, have been used in many, many different <clears throat> forms of social interaction, economic interaction to, um, to basically facilitate a better result. And I thought this idea would be useful in thinking about civil resistance. If you think about a population that's living under tyranny, they're badly wounded. They, uh, they've lost their rights, they're being repressed, they have no property rights and on and on, they're subject to corruption. And so they're a wounded population the, and the wounds are complex, life and death and time sensitive. So I thought it might be interesting to go through an exercise where we can create no less than five and no more than nine questions that civil resistors could use to evaluate how they think they're doing in their campaign uh, of nonviolent action. And that's the point about the checklist. The subtopic being is how dissidents will win 21st century civil resistance campaigns. But what we're really saying is how dissidents will discover for themselves how they can win their own 21st century civil resistance campaigns. So I now want to go through a little bit of time um, with you on a few dimensions of the book. If we could go to the next slide. The first I'd like to just share with you briefly is the definitions that I've used to sort of set up the book so that at least people understand the context in which the book has been shaped. And I wanna just go over them with you very quickly. And, and just to, to make the point, which I think is clear is that not everyone sees nonviolent action or civil resistance the same way I do, but trying to frame the way I see it helps I think in trying to make the checklist more useful in people's minds. So when we talk about civil resistance in the upper left, it's, it's synonymous with nonviolent conflict, people power, nonviolent struggle, nonviolent resistance. And nonviolent conflict is, you know, is in, embedded in our name, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. But it's also um, what's happened is that the term civil resistance has ultimately been, has, has evolved as the most used uh, term for what people do when they're living under tyranny. They have no military options. So they use strikes, boycotts, and, and uh, all sorts of tactics to undermine the legitimacy of the other side. What I try to do also in this little sheet here is to try to distinguish civil resistance with what people assume is the same thing. So civil resistance isn't peaceful dissent because if peaceful connotes the idea of tranquility, civil resistance is not that. The whole point of civil resistance is to create disruption that basically undermines the legitimacy of an authoritarian who wants peaceful, tranquil, obedient populations. It's also not the same as protest movements. And this is a term that's shown up recently. <coughs> not that street protests aren't prevalent, important and frequent, but they, there are very few movements that succeed over time on street protests only. 
And if you look at the movies we've created on the Indian independence movement, the Nashville lunch counter boycotts, the anti-apartheid movement, the Danish resistance to the Nazis, um, the uh, referendum on Pinochet, the Gedan shipyard strike, the Orange Revolution, and bring down the dictator, you'll find that many, many other tactics were at least, if not more important. Civil resistance is also strategic nonviolence when you think of nonviolence as a noun. Now, one of the great things I, I didn't realize this in, in the opening is that you are making a distinction in nonviolence international between the ethos of nonviolence and the effectiveness of nonviolent action. And, and this has been a point I've been trying to make for 50 years with greater success in that what we focus on in this book is what we would call nonviolent discipline, which is basically saying that we maintain nonviolent discipline because the ultimate strategy of civil resistance is to induce defections and you cannot induce people to defect who you're threatening to shoot. And this is why we have nonviolent discipline. When a lot of people who are not new, relatively new to the field say, why should we uh, be nonviolent, give up our violence? Aren't we giving something up? And one of the things that this book and others have tried to illustrate, and I think the data shows, is that by focusing on nonviolent tactics, you create more pathways to victory than if you focus on violent tactics. And I'll make this point again in a minute. Also, civil resistance movements, as I define them, are not the same as social justice movements, although the tactics and approaches can be similar. Social justice movements, for definitional purposes here, are movements that I would call positive sub-movements. You know, for example, same-sex marriage, climate change. They're movements that try to create a win-win situation in society. Very commendable, but a slightly different dynamic. Civil resistance campaigns are not positive sum competitions. They are negative sum competitions. And the metric of winning and losing has to do with power. Civil resistance movements is it, and, and the skills involved are really about how to transfer power from a tyrant to a population. And that's where the focus of our study is. Now, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things, as I said before, that I discovered in, in speaking with dissidents for, from 117 countries is the fear and disorientation they have when they come to see us. They want to explore the opportunities for nonviolent action, but they're certain that their situation is very difficult. And it's very important before you actually get into the checklist to, to share with them five key ideas and, uh, and to use that as the basis for them to think more openly and creatively about the checklist. So I'd like to go over those with you very briefly. So when a dissident comes to see us, the one thing we want them to know is that they should take solace in the historical fact that they are traveling a road many have traveled before and many others will travel in the future. Um, when, when you are living under a tyranny, you have two choices, two sets of two choices. The first is passivity or insurrection. The second is violent insurrection or nonviolent insurrection. And it's very important for people to know, know and take solace in that the, the, the choice of nonviolent insurrection has many, 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 many hundreds of cases of people making the same decision. The second idea they need to know is that there is no inherent prior condition that makes it impossible to win because the tactics change the conditions. And there's, as I mentioned before, there've been studies to show that, um, that there is no prior condition, including, as I said before, the nastiness of the authoritarian level of economic activity, low or high, or level of ethnic division that precludes the opportunity for success. The third idea we wanna share with them is that strategies based on violent tactics have a low probability of winning because they have limited pathways to victory by way of contrast, rejecting violent tactics and maintaining nonviolent discipline creates more possible pathways to victory. I won't, I'll, I'll stop there. I've, I've discussed this before, but that is a very important idea to keep in mind. So people in, when they go down and think about a checklist, they don't try to travel a path 
that straddles both violent and nonviolent tactics. The fourth is a campaign of civil resistance is the most reliable driver of democratic transitions. And that is becoming more apparent today than in the post-Cold War environment where people assume that the creation of great democratic institutions would be the bulwark against backsliding. And that's obviously not been the case in the last 15 years. Institutions need to be defended and that's what civil resistance does. And then the fifth, which is the most important thing dissidents can do to improve their chances of success is to develop their skills of organizing, mobilizing, resisting. So their skills are superior to their authoritarian adversary. So the focus on skills and the possibilities of skills being the great determinants to who wins and loses is one of the ways we reduce fear in our discussion with dissidents. So now I just wanna travel quickly to, if we could fly, go to the next slide, to the checklist itself. And I'm gonna go through this quickly. We divided the checklist, remember, was between five and nine things. But, you know, Gowanda basically demanded, and I've got eight. And the first four have to do with building capabilities. And I'll just read these real quickly. And these are, remember, that's not a formula for success. These are questions dissidents need to ask themselves in terms of focusing on their strengths and weaknesses. So the first one is, is the civil resistance campaign unifying around aspirations, leaders, and a strategy for winning? Second is, is the civil resistance campaign diversifying its tactical options while maintaining nonviolent discipline? The third is, is civil resistance campaign sequencing tactics for maximum disruption with minimum risk? I'll be back to that in a second. And the fourth is, is civil resistance campaign, is the civil resistance campaign discovering ways to make external support more valuable? We just um, basically uh, funded Maria and Erica Chenoweth on a study about what um, one of the most important things outsiders can do to help dissident movements inside a country. And they basically conclude it's the transfer of knowledge that ultimately is the most consistently useful. <coughs> then we have four that go from building capabilities to navigating conflict. Each one of these, as you see, has the word likely. So you're trying to speculate on, on trends. So the first is, are the number and diversity of citizens confronting the tyranny likely to grow? Is the tyrant's belief in the efficacy of violent repression likely to diminish? Are potential defectors among tyrants key supporters likely to increase? And is a post-conflict political order likely to emerge consistent with democratic values? So those are the eight, and we could talk about that in the uh, subsequent conversation. Let me end, if we could go to the next chart, <coughs> to, I think, one thing that I think illustrates the question of what does skills mean. So going back to checklist question three, is the civil resistance campaign sequencing tactics for maximum disruption and minimum risk? And um, this is in the book, it's uh, figure 14, prioritizing by expected impact. And I just want to close by going over this chart with you because it's an interesting way to think about what skills mean. So if you look at the upper right quadrant, you see what we call dissidence terrain. And the lower left contract quadrant is the tyrant's terrain. So if you are a dissident, you want to, in the upper right-hand corner, you want to have the least amount of disruption for the most amount of defection. And if you're the tyrant, you want to have the most amount of disruption of society, create the maximum pain for the least amount of defection. And if the tyrant is successful, where you actually get disruption but no defection, you lead to apathy which is in the upper left-hand quadrant. Now, if you look at the tyrant's terrain, his question is, how do I have the least amount of repression for the most amount of obedience? Not even repression, but the threat of repression. The civil resistor wants to create the most amount of repression for the least amount of obedience. And if actually what occurs is that repression leads to no increment of obedience, you have what we call backfire. And when you have backfire, you're, you're, more, you're probably very close to winning. So let me stop there. Um, and I'd love to hear the respondents and um, we'll be answering questions when, uh, when it's all done.